please be seated. Welcome to Salt Lake Community College and to our first annual fall convocation. Please join me in thanking one more time our student jazz ensemble who played the prelude music and the bagpipers who accompanied the processional. They've provided a great beginning. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our distinguished platform guests. We appreciate their accepting our invitation to participate with us today in the beginning of this new tradition. Please hold your applause until I have uh, completed the introduction of all guests. And I would ask each uh, guest as he or she is being introduced to rise so they may be recognized. Beginning on my left on the first row, Dave Carlson, uh, we welcome Dave back with us after his tragic accident, our student body president. Mark Fisher, our student body vice president. Dr. Frank Budd, president of Salt Lake Community College. Mr. John M. Huntsman, who will be introduced in a few minutes. Regent Karen Huntsman, Utah State Board of Regents. Ms. Melody Lambert, President of Salt Lake Community College Faculty Senate. On the second row, Ms. Jerry McDonald, a Salt Lake Community College faculty member. Mr. Bob Cantonwine, also a Salt Lake Community College faculty member. Regent Alleen Clyde, Utah State Board of Regents. Dr. Cecilia Foxley, Associate Commissioner of Academic Affairs with the Utah System of Higher Education and representing the commissioner. Mr. M. Dale Ensign, Salt Lake Community College Board of Trustees. Mr. Thomas Forsgren, uh, also a Board of Trustees member. Mr. Randy Foote, Salt Lake Community College alumni president and Salt Lake Community College Board of Trustee member. Uh, president J. L. Nelson, Salt Lake Community College President Emeritus. President O. D. Carnahan, Salt Lake Community College President Emer Emeritus. On the third row, beginning on my left, <coughs> Mr. Glenn Slight, a program participant. Ms. Jenny Bennett, a program participant. Superintendent Lauren Burden, Superintendent of the Granite School District. Superintendent Michael G. Jacobson, Tooele School District. President Stephen Woodhouse, LDS Business College. Dr. Geraldine McIntyre, University of Utah, Vice President of Academic Affairs. Mr. Heber Hunt, Salt Lake Community College Business Vice President. Ms. Catherine Boswell, Salt Lake Community College Assistant to the President. And Mr. Brent Goodfellow, Salt Lake Community College Executive of Assistant to the President. Let's welcome our guests. As indicated in the theme of today's program, we are continuing a tradition of excellence. Seeds of that great tradition were sown over the years by such visionary leaders as Howard Gunderson, Jay, Jay Nelson, Dale Kogel, and Orville Orville Carnahan, all former presidents of this institution. We are delighted to have two of these great men with us today. We continue that tradition of excellence under the able leadership of Dr. Frank Budd. Although different in many characteristics, these men share a deeply felt value and belief. The value for and belief in great teaching. They have established that institutional value. They have developed a place, encouraged an atmosphere in which great teaching can and does occur. Today they know that this community college embodies the very hallmark of the entire community college movement in America, excellence in classroom teaching. This community college provides an atmosphere where students learn 
because teachers teach. At Salt Lake Community College, the classroom is a place where our ideas are vigorously pursued and where partnerships in learning are encouraged. Our heritage of teaching excellence and collaborative learning provides a background for this new tradition, this first annual fall convocation. The planning, prepara preparation, and realization has occurred as a result of a coming together, a convocation, if you will, of students, faculty, and administration of this fine college. It seems fitting that we join together in the shadows of the construction of our new library, a universal symbol of learning to celebrate and to honor both teaching excellence and student learning as we begin a new academic year. It gives me great pleasure also to announce a second new tradition for Salt Lake Community College. A distinguished teacher lecture series will begin this year. The lecture series will also be a collaborative effort of the college community. The Faculty Senate in their retreat last week expressed informal support for the idea. The student leaders want to participate. President Budd is an enthusiastic supporter of the idea. Student and faculty leaders, the academic vice president and the student services vice president will form a task force to develop guidelines and plans to implement the Distinguished Faculty Lecture Series. You will be asked soon to nominate a colleague to help on this important task force. You will be asked to make suggestions to build upon the idea of honoring a distinguished faculty member with a reduced teaching load and or a stipend to prepare for and deliver a scholarly teaching uh, presentation of her or his discipline. You will be asked to help in the planning to honor one of your distinguished colleagues who represents the wonderful activities which abound in the classrooms and in the laboratories of Salt Lake Community College. We ask all of you now to participate in continuing a tradition of excellence, excellence in college teaching and excellence in student learning. Join us as we begin two new Salt Lake Community College traditions the first annual fall convocation, and the distinguished faculty lecture series. Let me now introduce to you Dr. Frank Budd, president of Salt Lake Community College. After Dr. Budd's remarks, the program will continue as outlined until the conclusion of the remarks of our distinguished speaker, industrialist John Huntsman. President Budd. Thank you, Dr. Erickson. To our honored guests, our faculty, staff, and students, good morning. This is a great occasion because we are establishing a tradition for Salt Lake Community College. Traditions and celebrations are essential ingredients for the success of institutions of higher education. The wearing of the academic regalia is representative of our earliest beginnings in higher education and refers us to a long-standing tradition of our profession. The concept of convocation is tradition. It is a calling together of scholars, educators, and students to discuss matters of interest and importance to the educational community. Today we, the faculty, staff, and students of Salt Lake Community College, initiate this as a new tradition for our great college. Salt Lake Community College is truly a college on the move. As the fastest growing institution within higher education in the state of Utah, we will serve over 27,000 people this year. This includes students seeking college credit in vocational, general, and transfer education. It includes employees of over 650 businesses and industri industrial entities within the valley and it includes contract education, short-term intensive training, custom fit for industry, and applied technology center opportunities for high school and adult students. Our students range in age from young teenagers to those well beyond retirement age. Over half of our student body is female, and most of our students work while attending school. We are among the leaders in the state in promoting diversity in our faculty, staff, and our student body. We are the People's College. In his recent book, On Cue, 
the causing of quality in higher education, Daniel Seymour points to the philosopher Kierkegaard's definition of the immediate men. These are the individuals who tranquilize themselves with the trivial so that they can lead normal, unencumbered lives. For these people, it is too uncomfortable to ask difficult questions, to tackle tough problems, and accept challenge as opportunity. Rather, they avoid doubt and uncertainty and keep a narrow focus on the small problems of life. They take the easy path. We as educators, we as leaders in a profession that uses ideas, knowledge, and discourse as the substance of our profession, and you as students can ill afford to take such a path. For those of us here at this college, growth, rapid change, and funding challenges can easily blur our real mission. Our mission is much greater than registering as many students as the computers will handle. It is much greater than balancing budgets. Of course, these tasks must be accomplished if we are to proceed and go forward in our direction, but they do not constitute our mission, our business, nor our value system. Our real mission is to provide quality, quality teaching and quality learning experiences for our students. Yes, we must think of new and creative ways to accept as many students as our resources will allow. But we cannot forget that students who come to us deserve a meaningful, useful experience, and that is our real challenge. Throughout this year, we will be meeting as a college family to discuss and plan appropriate ways to identify and measure the quality environment of this college. Within this context, we must believe we are a quality place and that our students are receiving an appropriate education. Then we need to acknowledge appropriate accountability to those outside of the institution. We must be prepared to demonstrate our quality. And you, who are students here, must believe and advocate that you are part of a quality enterprise. You must feel pride in what this college has attained, pride in the presence, and eager anticipation for its future. We can do it but not without thought, hard work, and perhaps most important of all, internal integrity. This will be our challenge for the coming year. I welcome each of you to this great college and to the beginning of a new academic year. I hope it is a year which will make a positive change in your life forever. Thank you. No hunger 
Thank you. Thanks, Mark. I have to smile for the camera. <laughs> Even though I kind of got a crooked smile. It is important to have goals in this life. Without them, your life wouldn't have much direction. For example, I was in the hospital, and I still am. I've been there for nine weeks. It has been my goal for a while to come out here and to talk today. Without that goal, I wouldn't have been able to address you because I haven't even had a voice until last week. Um, my talk is about goals. I'd like to say to learn to set them then work to accomplish and, ch and ch achieve them. Without goals, there wouldn't be much to aim for. Some of the goals I've set are hard, and are first. Or my first goal is to get better. When you set goals, you have to prioritize them. It is important because some, ex some, for example, are more pressing than others. Let me tell you, I didn't get. I didn't think. I, I didn't think correctly. How could I expect to get a job? 
I'd be required to think about a lot of problems in solving them. It is important for you to know that one of my accomplished goals, first prioritized goals, is to get better so that I can accomplish my other goals. For example, I would like to graduate from Salt Lake Community College and go on and finish all my schooling. I'd like to get married and provide for my family. I want to be an example for my family and friends. They have done a lot for me already just by their support. I'd like to introduce you to my supporters up here. Okay, this one is my nurse on my left. Her name's Lori. And for Lisa. Sorry about that, Lisa. <laughs> I'm kind of nervous up here. It's a big crowd. If some of you turn around in the front row, you can see. <laughs> yeah, back there, it's kind of nerve-wracking. Then there's my mom right here. Then this is my vice president, Mark Fisher. And he's going to address you in a minute, if it's okay with you guys. I want to return the favor by reaching my goals. I have other goals to reach that are important, and it's important that I strive to meet all my goals. Otherwise, life doesn't mean much to me. I would like to thank you for all coming out today to hear my talk, non-members of this school and everything. Um, I hope it has influenced you and inspired you to set some goals for yourselves. One of the goals that you guys should probably set is to continue the tradition of excellence at Salt Lake Community College. Um, now I'd like to have my vice president, Mark Fisher, talk to you, address you. What he has to say is important, so be sure you pay attention. It's worth your time. Thank you for coming or taking part in today's convocation. I'd like to thank those up here who have helped me too. Is that all right? I'd like to take just a few moments. Uh, yesterday when I went to speak with Dave and finalize everything, he told me he was going to speak for 10 minutes. I told him we only had five, <laughs> so he had to cut it down. And, but I, we're more than happy that Dave has been able to make it this far. Um, Dave, as Dave spoke about, I would also like to speak about setting goals. I, I just wanted to build on what Dave had to say. Dave has been a great example for me and I hope for everybody that attends this institution. Dave has uh, overcome huge barriers to be here today, and it was all because he set goals to be here. He wanted to be here, he loves Salt Lake Community College, and he loves serving the students as our student body president. Uh, one thing that I'd like to say shortly is that um, this sometimes uh, education gets very hard, and things don't go exactly the way that we like them to go. But we realize that it's the most important factor that we have here. Education is empowerment. We, the students, now need to buckle down, do what we have to do, make the sacrifice to gain an education, to become educated so that we can make America a better place. This is a strong country, and we need our students and everybody else's students to make the difference, to make the change for the future, to make this a better country even for our children. Thank you for your time. Judd told me I had only three minutes, and I don't know whether to complain or not, but uh, I'm going to add a fourth minute to my three planned ones by digressing and saying something to David. Uh, several years ago, a young friend of mine was injured in a terrible car accident in Heber. When Bernie came to, he was a C4 quadriplegic. That means nothing moves from the fourth vertebrae down. It's a long story that I'll make short, but where Bernie found his life coming together again was at Salt Lake Community College Skills Center and with the projects with industry which taught him how to use a computer. I met him as a student in my business classes and I want you to know that next year he will graduate from law school sitting in a wheelchair but with that kind of accomplishment behind him over this many years. So. David, I have full confidence that you will achieve your goals, and I hope that by relating Bernie's story briefly, many of you understand that this college is about many things, not just uh, 
faculty, not just students, but about opportunity and about people and industry who work together for that. Having a few minutes to speak to students is like this, in a group like this, is a rare opportunity for a faculty member. I welcome the opportunity and I've addressed my remarks specifically to students, although not exclusively to students. I hope that our coming together will be a tradition that strengthens us all. I also support the original purpose of a convocation, to assemble scholars to hear and express opinions and to reach agreement through the exercise of free discussion. That's something we probably need to consider as a tradition here at Salt Lake Community College where we discuss in a forum one with another. With us today are many exemplary educators, any one of whom could stand before you and speak to you about our commitment as educators to you as students. I have just a short time and realize that what you're going to hear are the thoughts of just one educator. Please consider carefully what I say. Think critically about it. Thinking critically is one of your prime responsibilities as a student. Then accept only what you find sound. As you commit yourself to your studies at Salt Lake Community College, don't let fear be your motivation to do or not to do something. Don't be afraid of paradox, of contradiction, of ideas that don't match with or that threaten your own. Don't be afraid of being wrong. Accept natural consequences for your actions, right or wrong. Be willing to sacrifice time, effort, ego, and money for your education. But never, never sacrifice your integrity under any circumstances. Students who cheat, and nationally many admit that they do, sell their integrity for five points or five or ten percent, and it's not unreasonable to see that they later have no problem sacrificing other people's money and livelihood when they participate in insider trading, savings and loan scandals, or other corruptions in America. Compare yourself with others only for inspiration. Otherwise, you end up with a misplaced and distorted sense either of inferiority or superiority. Learn to speak and write clearly, to think critically, and to reason soundly. Whether you are learning to repair jet engines, build houses, teach children, or pursuing a degree in literature or art, each of you needs to reason well and to express yourself clearly. Use these tools of learning. Become rationally passionate about that which matters most, and each of us decides what matters most. My list includes fairness and justice and compassion and humanity. Never use another person, another student, a teacher, or a staff member merely as a means to your own ends. This categorical imperative from Immanuel Kant is known as respect for persons. Respect persons. He had another categorical imperative, universalizability, which paraphrase states, Never act in a way that you wouldn't will others to act. To do so, to live by a double standard, is to corrupt your integrity. Avoid elitism as if it were a plague, for as we know it today, that's exactly what it is, a scourge that separates and creates a false and destructive sense of superiority. In avoid all the isms that weaken, divide, and ultimately distort humanity. Isms like racism, sexism, homophobism. Don't be deceived by appearances. Don't confuse symbol for reality. Were I to remove this robe and hold it out here, it would not stand on its own. It is simply a symbol, one that some people consider worthwhile, one that some people consider divisive. Think about the reality beneath a symbol. Consider the fact that Joseph Mengele who with Adolf Hitler was one of the architects of the Holocaust, could have stood before you today in the robes of both an MD and a PhD. Yet with all his learning, he did not know how to reason soundly, which means that his reasoning had to be not only valid, but all premises had to be true, and his were not. And he did not know how to reason morally. In America, the majority did not know how to reason soundly or morally either, because the majority thought it right and moral to control and debilitate the American Indian, to enslave and use as chattel people they brought from Africa, and then bought. 
In America, we have, in Utah, we have our own Ted Bundy and Mark Hoffman, both of whom had the right and safe appearance and counted on our tendency to see and hear what we want to see and hear and not to seek soundness and substance. Acknowledge the limits of your own knowledge. As Richard Paul has said, don't confuse fervent belief with knowledge or proof, emotionally held opinions with conviction, stubbornness with determination, judgmentalism with judgment, or point of view with reality. At the same time, remember the blind man and the elephant. One held the trunk and so thought the elephant like a hose. One held the tail and so thought the elephant like a rope. One touched the leg and so thought the elephant like a tree. One touched the side and so thought the elephant like a wall, and so on. Each thought his perception was truth, and each walked away still blind and with only a piece of the truth. We need one another, for each of us is blind in some way. Help and support and nurture one another. In the long run, these will emancipate us all. Thank you.
Well, it's wonderful to have our more sedate students perform, isn't it? It's just great to have our students performing. I think that's wonderful. It's my privilege this morning to introduce our most distinguished speaker, Mr. John M. Huntsman. Mr. Huntsman is Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Huntsman Group of companies including Huntsman Chemical Corporation, which is the largest privately held chemical company in the nation. He's well known for his leadership and contribution to the nation and the world's industrial scene. But I know that more important to him is his opportunity to give back to society and his fellow beings some of what he has realized through his success in business. More notably, uh, as a philanthropist, he is known for many dedicated efforts and generous contributions and support of the community and the state, nationally and, and internationally. He's well known for his dedicated efforts in rebuilding the country of Armenia after the 1988 earthquake occurred, which earned him the country's highest award, the Medal of Honor, presented to him by the Republic's Prime Minister. He's very recently returned from a, a very interesting trip, 18 days gone, 15 countries visited. Perhaps more important than all of these things to John is his family. His dear wife, Karen, who is on the stand with us this morning as a member of the Utah State Higher Education Board of Regents, and their nine children. I know that in his, in his order of priorities, this is his first priority. He's a great contributor. He's a great person. We're honored to have him with us today. Please join me in welcoming John M. Huntsman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Budd. It's a great privilege to be with you as I acknowledge the faculty and uh, our distinguished platform guests. David, your remarkable address, your gifted leadership, and Mark, your thoughtfulness as the vice president of this student body. You've been an inspiration to us today. David, I must say that in my recent tour of 15 countries, I'm not sure that I have been inspired as much as I have in the last hour by being here with you. And I thank you for that. Also, David, because of your great remarks, I've given my wife Karen my remarks, and I thought I'd just kind of visit with you informally today, if that's okay. May I tell you how overwhelmed I am with this great campus. You have a magnificent quality school, a beautiful, beautiful spot. And as I watch the faculty march uh, down to take their seats here today, I recognize many of them as leaders in our community, pillars, great leaders, gifted and talented people. I'm just overwhelmed by this great, great college, by Dr. Budd and by what his predecessors have done. And I commend each of you now as you go forward and develop a, a sense of quality in all that you do, a sense of excellence. May I take you back this morning just a few years and a few miles away? Because perhaps it would help you if I can recount some thoughts that have gone through my mind. I was born in Blackfoot, Idaho. Our home was consisted of only two rooms, and one of them was not a bathroom. So we would, w we would walk out a few yards beyond our little home whenever the urging was necessary. My father was a school teacher, a humble man. His father before him was a school teacher. And we had great happiness in our family. We had no material means. But we had a great desire to proceed and move ahead in life. Life has not been easy. Life is never easy. As we progressed through our teenage years, I remember that I had three or four jobs during high school. I rem remember my brother Blaine and I would each get on one side of the lawnmower and mow lawns for people. All through high school, I would work at J.C. Penney's in the evenings 
and then afterwards would clean a meat market at night to help my father get through graduate school. During those years, they were difficult years. We were living in a $45 a month student housing, and I had one shirt to my name, and that was my high school. People often say, John Huntsman, you come from a lo lot of wealth and affluence. How do you know how those other folks live? Well, may I just say to you, life is filled with a lot of challenges. Life is filled with some of the greatest opportunities today that ever faced man or woman. And I have been very grateful and very appreciative for the opportunities that have befallen our family. When we decided to start our business, everyone said, no, don't do it. Because you see, the timing is never right to start a business. The timing is never right to go back to school. The time is never right to start your own personal challenge. There are always excuses and there are always roadblocks. And then when the bank said, no, we will not give you the money, I had to develop a philosophy that meant no means yes. Whenever you hear the term no, you must in your mind just mentally say, this really means yes, because there's an opportunity here. And as David got up to speak today, I thought, David, of how many times people had probably said no to you. And yet you were here because you wanted to be here. And it was important for you to be here. We started our businesses, and I made Karen a pledge that if ever we were successful, and nine out of 10 businesses fail, we would keep two things foremost in mind. Number one, we would give back to society that which it had given us. And number two, we would build our business around quality and excellence. We would never settle for second best. Well, that was 22 years ago, and a lot of water has gone under the bridge. I remember when we set up our first research and development lab. My competitors at Dow and Amico and some of the big companies had several thousand people in their research lab. Our research laboratory consisted of Karen at home with a washing machine, a dishwasher, thank you. <laughs> and as I would produce products, Karen would test them out and see if they passed the rent cycle. If these products, plates, bowls, bit dishes, variety of other new products that were new in America in the late 60s and early 70s, if they could get through a Sears dishwasher Without breaking or cracking, I would tell our production people, proceed to produce the products. They've passed our R&D department head. <laughs> little by little, and I thought that was terrific because it was a remarkable test. Little by little, we would move on and eventually build a business that today has 38 facilities. Some of our facilities are as large as this campus throughout the world. And yet I look at it and I, uh, and, I, and I go back to my roots. And I say, how did it happen? Could it happen anywhere but in America? Probably not. It happens because we surround ourselves with wonderful people, talented people, gifted people. We give them the credit and we give them the authority and we let them proceed in their role of of being excellent. Shakespeare had a great expression and it's carved on the tombstone of my mother's grave down in Fillmore. Shakespeare said, sweet are the uses of adversity. And I think of my mother many times. She passed away of cancer when I uh, was much younger. But I think of that wonderful remark, sweet are the uses of adversity. Because my dear friends, you know David knows that anything we do in life is going to be fraught with opposition and fraught with adversity. And there is nothing we can do to stop it. The only thing that we can do is be big enough and strong enough to overcome it. And then not carry that baggage around with us. Not let it be known that we stumbled or fell or had a problem. I was diagnosed last year with cancer. And my heart was broken. 
And I thought, here I am in the prime of life. We've built this remarkable business. We're able to go throughout the world. We're able to give back some of the things, some of the blessings that the good Lord has given us. What will happen to my life? And then I said, stop that. That's nonsense. Don't think about yourself. Think about others. You'll get over this thing. And what if you don't? What if you don't? What difference does it make? What matters is what we do while we're living and to be positive and upbeat and committed and to be thoughtful to one another and gracious to one another and to strive again and again for excellence. Last year I was very, very honored because the President of the United States gave 100 awards for beautification of America. And 10 of those awards were given to industry. And only two of the awards were given to the chemical industry. And we were very honored that our company won both of the awards in the chemical industry at the White House last year for quality, for excellence, for beautification of our country and our lands. And I was touched because I had felt that perhaps we had kept the pledge that Karen and I had made when we started our life together. The quality, that excellence would never be forgotten and that we would strive for it. I went through one of our warehouses last week when I was traveling uh, through many countries. We have a beautiful black lady who is uh, one of my great uh, friends. She has this huge, huge warehouse where she is a manager. It is the finest, cleanest, neatest warehouse I have ever seen in the world. And Lucinda takes great pride in that. And I often think, when I see Lucinda, I, I say to her, Lucinda, why are you such, why is excellence and quality so important to you? And she always said, I set a goal for myself, that no matter what job I had, it didn't matter. It didn't matter if I was a college professor or a medical doctor. It didn't matter if I was a businesswoman or manager of this warehouse. I'm going to be the very, very best at whatever I do. And I made that pledge to myself. And Lucinda is very, very good at what she does. I would only mention another aspect about quality. On December 7th of 1988, news flashes came around the world about the devastating earthquake in far off Soviet Armenia. Many of us had never heard of Armenia. 500,000 people homeless, 65,000 people killed, a small nation of three and a half million people devastated. I thought, they need our help. Something's drastically wrong to upset a country of that size. As President Budd has indicated, we began to move resources into that country. We've helped set up hospitals. We have one of the largest concrete fabricating centers in the world there, where we make 6,500 apartments per year to house 25,000 homeless people. Our goal there is to house 100,000 people whose homes were lost in the earthquake. Why were their homes lost in the earthquake? As we have sent our engineers to study that part of the world, we have seen that the concrete that they used was faulty, that there was no steel reinforcement, that the workmanship was shoddy, that in many cases the great cement panels were only held together like Legos by clips. And when the great earthquake came, they crumbled and tens of thousands were killed. we decided that our concrete would be made of high quality, reinforced to be able to withstand high level earthquakes should they come again. What a difference quality makes. This past week when I was there and in our plant, I called our employees together. And this was quite a remarkable thing to me. These people gathered and they weren't quite sure what to do. You see, they had lived in a communist country for the past 70 years. They had never been called together as a group of employees. They were leery. They, fear was in their eyes. They were trembling. They were concerned. There was, seemed to be a certain darkness about uh, their face. 
I called them together and said, this plant looks beautiful. You've done a quality job. You know, they'd never been told before that they'd done a quality job. They'd never been complimented before. And I said, because we're a capitalist, and because we thrive on incentives, I'd like to teach each of you an important lesson from America. I would like to give you your first bonus and presented each of our workers with 2,000 Soviet rubles. Now, 2,000 Soviet rubles in today's marketplace is roughly $10, not very much. But it amounts to about two weeks' work in that part of the world. And I said, it isn't the amount of money that we're giving each of you. I want you to know that you have done an excellent job. I have never seen a cleaner, neater facility in my life. I want to commend you. I want to thank you. I want to tell you that you're my friends and that I hold you in great affection and that you're good people and that you have a wonderful future. Tears came down their eyes. They'd never been told before that they were good people. They didn't know that they could do a quality job. They, were, they weren't used to that kind of talk. What a living, memorable experience in our lives. May I conclude with just a couple of thoughts. It was the 4th of July about four years ago, and my son and I were just coming back from Japan when we received a call from the Minister of Industry in the People's Republic of China. They said, can you come over and visit our country? We would like to visit with you about the establishment of some of your technology in our land because we believe that your technology is the best in the world, and we would like to have facilities in this country representing that. I thought, should I go to China or go home with Karen and spend the 4th of July? The decision was quite easy. I went to China. Karen has never let me forget that. But a, but a rather remarkable thing happened. We arrived there, and the Minister of Industry and these Chinese leaders were there. And we had this large banquet. And out came a cake, a red, white, and blue cake, a cake about three feet long and about two feet wide, colored with red, white, and blue frosting. Through an interpreter, the Minister of Industry said, this is the 4th of July for you. It's a very important day. And then he said something I'll never forget. He said, you come from the state of Utah. May I tell you a little bit about the state of Utah? Your people are hard workers. Your people are the best educated of any state in America. Your people care about their ancestors, about elderly people. They're hard workers. They're honest. They're ethical. Tears came down my eyes on the 4th of July as this great communist leader was telling me about the benefits of the great state of Utah and the people who live here and reside here. I was deeply honored to be a resident of this state. As we were coming home last week, one of our group ran out of film. And they looked around in a country we were in, a country where not many Americans visit, and they looked around for film. They saw a film with various colors of packaging and the individual said, no, I don't want to buy that film. And he kept going from store to store in this community where we were located until he saw a yellow package. And in the yellow package, there was Kodak film. And Kodak film over the years had built an image of excellence, of quality. And he knew he would w it would work, and he reached in and pulled out a box of film recognizable by a yellow box and by great quality. I would hope and pray that each one of us would be recognizable by our quality, by our excellence, and whatever we do in life, whatever field you major in, whatever subject you teach, whatever occupation you possess, the people could pull you out and say, this person is quality. They're made of excellence. I want to be with them. I respect them. Thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you very much, Mr. Huntsman. Thank you, Dave Carlson. We've been given uh, great challenges today to set our sights even higher, to strive for greater quality, and to continue, continue our tradition of excellence here at Salt Lake Community College. Let's give our guests uh, for another round of applause for their wonderful ideas and the beautiful music. Immediately following uh, the conclusion of the convocation, the Associated Students of Salt Lake Community College will sponsor a barbecue lunch in the East Quad, the center quad of the college, just east of here. Uh, a minimal charge of $1.50 per person for a real great lunch, so let's join, us, join them there. Uh, we will now conclude our convocation with Glenn Slight singing the national anthem he will be accompanied by Jenny Bennett. Please arise for the national anthem. Then conquer we must when our 